I have a sterling opportunity for me to introduce to you a sensational young man. That man, Douglas T. Snar, is our next speaker. Doug Snar made a name for himself by building a successful, prosperous outdoor advertising company. In the best tradition of free enterprise, Doug Snar built himself a better mousetrap. He found a need, salesman, and he filled it. The signs his outdoor advertising company offered were vertical, tall, eye-catching, rather than horizontal. Advertisers saw them, liked them, bought them, and his company prospered. Then Doug Snar found himself in the unlikely position of forcing the federal government in Washington to rewrite a bill that would tear down his signs. Doug's victories in Washington now are legendary. You read about him in all the great magazines and newspapers on television at age 35. Anyone reading Time magazine, the Christian Science Monitor, the Washington Post, and other national publications could easily get the idea that Doug was the most colorful man in Washington, and very probably he was. Doug's early years, though, were blighted, however, interesting note, by a crippling physical defect. Experts, even his own family and friends, told him nothing could be done, that he couldn't be helped, that he couldn't even help himself. But Doug Snar has his own special medicine. It isn't patented, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't cost a cent. He is here tonight to tell you about the ingredients of the wonderful cure that banished his crippling childhood condition. Positive thinker, ladies and gentlemen, Douglas T. Snar, right here on our stage. In facing you today, I'm experiencing one of the happiest moments of my life. Because I'm free, I'm out of prison, I'm out on parole. For you see, I've been a jailbird. Nearly one half of my 43 years were spent in prison, and even worse than prison, in solitary confinement. I want to tell you how great it is to be free and to share my story of freedom with you. Because I have found in life that when you discover another man's story, you begin to see yourself. Well, my days as a jailbird began with me sitting in the back row of the classroom, hoping beyond hope that I would not be asked to take part in any classroom discussion simply because talking was beyond my capability. For you see, I stuttered and stammered, hopelessly and totally. Stuttering was my prison. Now, stuttering is when you repeat a sound, a da 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 sound. Stammering, on the other hand, is when your jaws lock and you're blocked and nothing comes out. When it began, I can't recall. I only know I always had the impediment. And as time went on, the stuttering and the stammering increased in intensity. All through grade school and junior high and high school, I suffered the same heartbreak. The harder I tried to talk, the stronger the paralyzing habit gripped me. Everyone in the school knew I stuttered, and everyone laughed about it. I just laughed right along with them. I didn't let them know how much it hurt. The big joke in the school was uh, a teacher asked Doug a question. We want to hear him stutter. But deep inside, I was bursting with words. I wanted to be heard. But I couldn't talk. My tongue was tied. My jaws were locked. I was confined in prison. And one way or another, all of us here today are, are confined, are restrained, are limited, are in some form of a prison. How many of you are as free as you want to be? 
How many of you have been emancipated from the prison of fear, the fear of standing up and talking to a group of people, the fear of worry and bad habits, the inferiority complex? I could go on and on and on. The, a track record of failure, being overweight, smoking, drinking, the list is endless. No man is a total success unless he is free, and it isn't the money in the bank, and it isn't the honors of man, and it isn't a great big fancy title, and a great big car, a great big house. That's the outward, the overt, the great big show. But true and permanent and vital and meaningful success lies in that very special truth that you know that you have lodged deep in every fiber of your being sufficient personal power that you're in charge. You're the boss. You have risen above yourself. You call the shots. You have gained control over your mind. And with that controlled mind, you command, and your body obeys. Your spirit has indeed transcended your flesh. Now, all the years that I was growing up, I realized that I wasn't free. My body rebelled. I couldn't control my tongue. I had to make some decisions. And the difference between me now and then is those decisions. And without those decisions, I would still be in prison. And the purpose of me being here today is to share those decisions with you. Now, the first decision to freedom, if we'll stop and think about it, is rather obvious. It's to look ourselves in the eye and face the truth about ourselves. You know, and the best person in the whole world to tell you the truth about you is you, if you will but listen to the truth that is within you. I remember as a 15-year-old boy walking up and down the potato rows on our farm in eastern Idaho, oh, about uh, five miles west of the uh, metropolis of Idaho Falls. Population then, oh, about 18,000. In between pulling the weeds, I talked to the potato vines. It was fantastic. I could just talk and talk and talk and never stutter once. My imagination soared off into the heavens, and you know, I could just picture myself standing before a throng of thousands, uttering uh, elegant phrases effortlessly. There were times I imagined the potato vines talked back. Our farm was on a hill. As I looked out over the valley and I saw the lights glimmering from those far-off buildings, I knew I had to go. I had to leave the security and the comfort of those potato rows and my wonderful friends, the talking potato vines. I had to say goodbye to my little imagined world and go face the reality of real talking people. So I walked to the city of Idaho Falls. Along with about three other boys, I tried out for a job as janitor and stockroom boy in the local five and dime. I knew I was the best man, but I couldn't take any chances. After all, uh, they were talkers, smooth talkers. So I approached the manager with a bargain. I agreed to do the work as janitor and stockroom boy but I agreed to do more work. I'd be his sign painter at no extra charge. And as I stood there trying to tell him my proposition, and fighting for each word, and he was fighting right along with me for each word, and it was hurting me, and I could tell it was hurting him perhaps worse than it was hurting me, trying to face the truth about me, I couldn't help but think, how can he refuse? What a deal, what a bargain. Advertising man and stockroom boy and gender all wrapped up into one package and for the price of a floor mopper. Well, I 
tell you this, I didn't stand there and ask for sympathy and make a bunch of excuses because my presentation was a disaster. In fact, I struck a bargain. I gave him the best of the bargain. And he, in turn, gave me his very best. He gave me his confidence. I got the job. I learned a, a great deal right then about uh, human nature. When we have enough courage to face the truth about ourselves, even if that truth hurts, it brings the best out in them. They can't resist helping us. About this time, I was uh, struck by the uh, prettiest girl in the uh, high school. I was a sophomore. A close uh, friend uh, understood, and uh, he helped to arrange a date. That girl uh, was a real knockout. On a scale of 10, in my eyes, anyway, uh, she was a good 9.99. <clears throat> and I remember walking up and down the sidewalk in front of her house, trying to gather enough courage to ring that doorbell. And by the time I reached the door, I was petrified. And sure enough, her father answered the doorbell. And after uh, sizing me up, he demanded, Well, young man, what's your name? And I struggled, and I fought for the power of expression, but nothing came out except sweat. And I could see him staring at me, and I tried again. My mouth formed the words, my face contorted, I turned red. I couldn't understand why me, the orator who could talk so well to the potato vines, couldn't even say his name. And it seemed as if a thousand eternities passed. And finally, my date arrived, floating down a circular staircase, Gosh, in a most elegant dress, she graciously called out, to, Oh, Dad, a meet Doug Snar. And I was saved. You know, I must have been a great date. After all, she was about to do what every woman yearns for. She was able to do all the talking. When I drove home that night, the truth about me became painfully clear. If I was going to amount to a hill of potatoes, I had to make a jailbreak. I'd fallen in love. The way I talked, there's no way in the world I could talk her into marrying me. And at that point, I, I made that uh, second decision to freedom. And that second decision was that after looking myself in the mirror, I vowed to change my life, to change a stuttering Doug Snar into a talking Doug Snar. Now, to change my life required about two things. First, I had to find someone to teach me how to talk. Well, that's easier said than done. And secondly, I had to find the money to pay the bills. And that's also easier said than done. So it uh, Age 17, I borrowed $50 from my father and started my own sign company. Now, I could design and create and imagine and paint and draw. My problem was there's just no way in the world I could sell any signs. So I took in a partner, a mouthpiece, and with his uh, fast-moving jaws and my uh, dexterous fingers, uh, we became the uh, paint-spattered teenage tycoons of eastern Idaho. But you know all I wanted in this whole wide world was to be able to stand on the doorstep of my girlfriend's house and look her father in the eye and to say without stuttering, good evening, sir. My name's 
Doug Snar. And after I'd earned enough money to pay the tuition fees, we headed south 300 miles to Provo, Utah, to the Brigham Young University. Determined to have all my problems solved, I, I was convinced within the hallowed walls of a university were the solutions to all the problems of the world. And as you know at the Y, we all had to take a scripture class. And the class always began with prayer. And the very first day of school, <laughs> sitting on that back row, slouched in that seat where no one could see me, in walked the instructor, David Yar, and he picked up the roll, and he called out, uh, Doug Snar, would you give the prayer? A dagger of fear drove through me. I got up, I walked to the front of that class, I turned, I folded my arms, I bowed my head. Oh, I prayed all right, but only God could hear. And the instructor, perceiving my plight, he came over and he tenderly put his arm around me and he bowed his head and he prayed for me. And I was wiped out. When I returned to that empty seat, I felt the glances. You know what it's like, kids that age, they looked, but they didn't look. And I knew right then, once again, how a freak must feel. And at the end of the class, the instructor pulled me over to the side and he said, I'm sorry, I asked you to pray. I promise you I'll never ask you to speak another word in my class. Please feel free and confident, continue to come to my class. You know, I appreciated his, uh, his empathy, his understanding. He was a sensitive man. But his solution to the problem wasn't the uh, solution that I knew it. I had to face that problem head on, not uh, run from it. So I, I enrolled in a special speech therapy program designed for stutters. I was given a battery of tests. Following the, the test, the uh, professor in charge sat me down. He said, now, uh, Brother Snar, we don't know why people stutter. In fact, science doesn't know why people stutter. But one thing we do know, that stuttering is not a disgrace. After all, everyone has a problem. Some have a wart on the end of their nose or eyes or something or fingers missing. Yours happens to be stuttering. Now, the solution to your problem is to develop the right attitude so that the problem doesn't destroy you. Now, you've got to learn to live with stuttering. And here at the Y, we're going to teach you how to adjust and to adapt yourself to the reality of your impediment. You know, his words were sweet. They had a certain ring of logicality to them. They were soothing and promising. And for a moment, he just about had me. But it was surrender, and I knew it. He was asking me to quit, to give up before I even started to fight. Have you ever stuttered? I asked. No. And then I told him, I don't know how I got the words out, but I got them out. You don't know how I feel, or anybody else feels who suffers with stuttering. And if it's the last thing I do on this earth, I will learn to talk. And I got up. And I walked away, and boy, did I feel low. I continued at the BYU. My stuttering worsened. I was reduced to writing what I wanted to say on a pad. I couldn't even verbally answer the roll call. You know, as I look back across my life, and I observe the lives of others, particularly those who have excelled. One great common denominator looms above all others. 
If you will concentrate all your energies, if you will focus and narrow in on one objective, a solution will present itself. You know, it's a it's sort of a miracle. It will never, 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 never be a question of how do I do it. Don't fall into that rationalization trap. It will always be a question of have I the substance, have I the stuff, have I the guts to do what must be done. About that time, towards the end of the school year, I found myself uh, waiting my turn in a barber shop, listening to a jabbering barber. And seeking uh, relief, I picked up a little old dog-eared magazine and opened it up. And there it was, right before my eyes. A little obscure advertisement grabbed me, and two words stood out like mountains. Stuttering and free, I read on. Send for a free booklet. Learn how to be cured. I jumped up. I ran out of that barbershop. I forgot to get my hair cut. I cranked out a letter to the Benjamin N. Bogue Institute for Speech Correction, Indianapolis, Indiana. And sure enough, in about two weeks, I got a great big package filled with testimonials from all kinds of people who'd found the uh, panacea for their impediment. They all testified that stuttering can be cured. Who's right? The professor? The doctorate degree? The sheepskin? The blue ribbons? The accolades? The acceptance from the intellectual community? Or these little old letters in this package? I tell you, I had to find out. I hitchhiked to Idaho Falls. I told my parents, I'm going to go to Indiana, and I'm going to get cured. Hold on, hold on, they said. Hold on. Being responsible, being concerned. They checked out the Bogue Institute. And to my consternation, we're told uh, it's a school of quackery. It's a great big fake. It's a big rip off all they want, the money, the tuition, $1,000. My dad came to me. He said, Doug, we've done our homework. We've checked out this Bogue Institute. And we're against it. Now, if you want to go, you'll have to earn the money. And I told him, I'm going to go even if I have to crawl. Now, I was 18 years of age. And that decision to go has proved to be the singular, most important decision of my life. And I'd made two other decisions. I looked in the mirror, and I didn't like what I saw. I faced the truth about me. I vowed to change my life. And now I made that third decision to freedom. Believe in yourself and your hunches. If I'd have listened to everybody else, they all said, Doug, you're a sucker. Don't go. I'd still be in Idaho Falls, talking to those potato vines. I needed money, and I needed it fast. So I cranked up my partner, my mouthpiece, and we agreed, come hell or high water, we're going to earn enough money to pay for that stuttering school. We painted signs all over eastern Idaho. Come uh, September 1, I boarded that old steam engine train at Pocatello, Idaho, Dad came to me again. He said, Doug, you better come back. A talking a lot better than you're a going. And the great day arrived. That momentous day in my life. Benjamin N. Bogue himself. I can see him standing there now a silver-haired man in his late seventies. He took me into his office and he, he sat me down. He said, now, young man, when I was your age, I stuttered just like you do. Now I can say any word. We're going to teach you how to talk. Now I know 
You've worked hard to get here. And that thousand dollars will prove to be the best investment of your life. And I watched the words tumble from his lips, and I was awed. His words were positive. They gave me hope, and I believed. And for the first time in my life, I put my head into my hands, and I cried like a baby. Now, Bogue had a very simple theory pursuant to stuttering. Stuttering is a mental problem. It's a habit. Therefore, it can be corrected. It's just that simple. Now, isn't it true? Most all of our problems in this life are mental. They're in the mind. Therefore, they can be corrected. Now, Vogue showed me how a man can change his life. He understood a most basic but great principle. It is possible in this life to start all over, to go back to square one. He taught me the fourth and perhaps the most important decision to freedom. Reprogram yourself. In other words, you take the error and the crud and the bad habits and all of the negative thinking and you throw it away and you replace that void with positive thinking and positive action and truth and the process of replacement is indeed the phenomenon of reprogramming. Now the, the first step in the reprogramming uh, a process of pursuant to stuttering was to go on a silence for 10 days. Literally, cease speaking for 10 days. Now, if you want something, write it down on a pad. Now, try it sometime uh, just for uh, one day. Well, uh, here's what happened. A marvelous sense of relief set in. All of the pressures incidental to speaking lifted. What Bogue was really saying was, stop experiencing failure. Forget the past. You can't do anything with the past anyway. You're not going to stutter anymore because you're not going to talk anymore. We're going to take you back to square one and start you all over. Now, when he was a young man, he observed while playing the piano that he could sing a song without stuttering. And the reason stutters can sing without stuttering is because of rhythm. And then he observed that the choir conductor waves and swings his arm in tempo with music. Likewise, he saw a connection. And therefore, I was instructed to take this right arm and to swing it in a half circle with each spoken syllable. Now, uh, let me demonstrate. My name is Doug Snar. Well, I was a little bit fast there, but at least you, uh, you get the idea. The first uh, few days were spent in uh, mastering difficult sounds. Hour after hour, we would uh, practice most unique exercises. Now, you take, for example, the letter B, a very difficult letter for a stutterer. A B, R, A, and a B, R, E, and a B, R, I, and a B, R, O, and so on and so on. Now, these aren't just funny little sounds. There's a principle involved. Start at a point where success is easy. Start simple and build success upon success. Now, anyone here today can achieve any goal that you have the courage to muster in your mind, if you will, but follow that 
principle. Start simple and pile success upon success and do not run faster than you have the strength. You know, I'd have been thrilled and delighted to have gone through the rest of my life swinging that talking arm. I tell you, I'd have considered myself the luckiest guy in this whole wide world. I just love practicing my talking arm. I remember uh, going into this uh, Ma and Pa Greasy Spoon Cafe. I was just starving for something to eat, and I, I walked up to the counter, and I locked eyes with the waitress, and I raised my arm, and she was watching me, and I took a great big deep breath of air, and I said, May I have a hamburger, please? That waitress was startled. <clears throat> but you should have seen the greasy spooners. They all did a double take. You know, when she brought that hamburger, I couldn't resist. The temptation was just too great. <clears throat> Some people talk with their mouths. Me? I talk with my arm. <laughs> At that point, I place my arm behind my back, and then I move my lips as if I were talking but didn't utter a sound. <laughs> then I remove the arm. See? Without my arm, I can't talk. <laughs> and then something happened. The magic of my talking arm started leaving me. Once in a while, when I would swing my arm, I stuttered. Fortunately, these moments of relapse were not frequent but they disturbed me greatly. And then it dawned on me. It's that old classical struggle that everyone here today has experienced many times. Whenever we try to improve ourselves, whenever we try to reach upward and to extend ourselves to achieve some lofty goal, the evil of opposition manifests its ugly head. I was at war. It's the war between positive thinking and victory or negative thinking and defeat. And in that context, I felt myself sinking into the quicksand of depression. Now, there's no one here. There's none of us that can afford the extravagance and the opulent luxury of remaining depressed. So I started to read and study and searching for that uh, missing link that would untie the knot in my tongue. And the words of that ancient philosopher Plato came to me. The first and best victory is to conquer self. To be conquered by self is of all things most shameful and vile. And as I read those words, I couldn't help but think. I agree, Plato. Gee, that's just great, Plato. But how do I conquer myself? Haven't I done everything? Haven't I followed the rules? Haven't I paid the price? And still I can't really talk. The American uh, philosopher uh, Henry David Throw, I think, said it just about right. Uh, desperate men do desperate things. And I was desperate. And I did what many desperate men do. All my life I'd heard the word prayer. I'd even heard stories how prayers were answered. 
Just like all of you today, I'd been taught that there was a God, but I wasn't convinced that God even knew I existed. I was alone in my bedroom, and I had to know if there was something extra out there, if there was a source of greater power, I knew I had to, to reach for it. And paradoxically, I knelt. And for the first time in my life, I completely opened up. I talked. I pleaded. I begged. I lost track of time. But then when I was physically exhausted, I felt a warm, peaceful reassurance. My spirit had touched a power. I'd had a conversation, and I could see out of those prison bars, and I rose with something extra. I felt impressed to go to church. I called the taxi. Unfortunately, it was late in the afternoon, and when we arrived at the church, the worship services were over. The doors were locked. I saw a little plaque with a name and a home address. And when we arrived at the home address, I could hardly see. It was dark. A rain slanted out of clouds the color of coal, and a large uh, man in his mid-thirties greeted me. Standing in the rain, I, I raised my arm and started. My name is Doug. Snar, I'm from Idaho. I'm here going to a stuttering school. I want to go to church. May I come in? You should have seen the look on his face. He had a little six-year-old daughter. She turned on her heels. She peeled rubber. She streaked to the far end of that house, screaming at the top of her voice, Mother, Mother, come quickly. There's a crazy man out in the rain talking with his arm. You know, those wonderful, God-fearing people, they just reached their arms right out, and they wrapped them right around me, and they pulled me right on inside. I guess I haven't the power of expression to express the gratitude I have for Wilbur and Hope Lawrence. About three weeks later, they asked me if I'd like to go to southern Indiana to visit their parents. Now, Mrs. Lawrence's mother became <clears throat> fascinated by my arm-swinging business. <clears throat> she couldn't figure out how a, a, an arm could produce words. And she got so excited and taken by the magic of my arm, she jumped up and she ran to the phone and she called the elder in charge of the local church. She said, you wouldn't believe it. I got a guy here from Idaho, and he talks with his arm. Can he give a two-and-a-half-minute talk tomorrow in Sunday school? <laughs> well, I spent a sleepless night. The times I got up, I literally I, I took a towel and I wiped away the, the sweat of the sheer terror. And the following uh, morning, uh, Brother Lawrence got up and introduced me to the congregation. He told them, now, <clears throat> this young man has never spoken before an audience because he's a stutterer. He then explained how I used my arm and turned the audience over to me. And I was terrified. My knees buckled. I was in trouble. I, I couldn't hang on to the podium because I had to use my arm to do the talking. <laughs> I then raised my arm, took a great big deep breath of air, and opened my mouth. 
And in that moment, I felt a powerful influence. The influence was light, potent, almost palpable, spiritual and real. And I knew that I could drop my arm and talk out just like anybody else. And I dropped my arm and I talked. And those moments were the most sublime and joyous I'd ever known. And when I sat back down, I knew I was still a stutterer. I still had to rely upon the arm. But I knew the greatest reality of all. Out there, God does exist. And fortified with that sure knowledge, my entire life changed, and I knew I was going to make it. In this life, there may not be magic, but there are miracles. And my miracle was the doing, the practicing. Ralph Waldo Emerson's right when he indubitably stipulated that practice is nine-tenths. The drilling, the follow-through, the sticking, the refusing to quit, the believing. God's miracle was that he was there. He loosed my tongue, and he gave me freedom. And the greatest miracle of all is the paramount, preeminent privilege of a partnership that all of us here today may enjoy of man and God pulling together. For let us never forget that God is the source of all our freedom. And let us pray that our governmental leaders never forget that truth. Well. <clears throat> I returned to the blue sagebrush, uh, the drifting sands, the, the tumbleweeds, the cactus, the unrelenting winds of eastern Idaho. You know, eastern Idaho is a place where you have to kind of lean in order to stand up straight. And I made a straight line to my girlfriend's house. Then I rang that doorbell. And once again, her father answered, Doug, can you talk? Boy, I was bursting, exploding with enthusiasm. I just couldn't wait. But to make sure I raised that secret weapon to the heavens. <laughs> Good evening, sir. My name is Doug Snar. The question became, now that I'm out of prison, how do I stay out of prison? But we remain free by continually putting ourselves to the test. You know, I've had some exciting and interesting tests in my life. I've been self-employed since 17 years of age. I've sold and built and owned outdoor advertising signs in 13 western states. I've negotiated bank loans in the millions of dollars and paid them off as agreed. I've lobbied two bills through the Congress of the United States, testified at numerous senatorial and congressional hearings, made many presentations to key staff members in the White House and state governors. I've dealt with the national press. I've worked with London banks on foreign matters, but I tell you, 
the most wonderful and sublime test of all was I married that girl. We've had uh, 21 years of sheer bliss, and I tell you, I've done my share of the talking. <laughs> but the most far out and unique test took place during the last 12 months. A year ago, this great positive thinking rally came to Salt Lake City. And I was sitting right over there. I brought my whole family. If it's good enough for me, it's good enough for the kids. And Dr. Schuler challenged us to choose a goal big enough that we could make God a part of that goal. And it came to me. That's it. Here's the ultimate challenge. My goal is to speak at least once on one of these positive thinking rallies with the greatest speakers in America. I got so excited. I was tingling and shaking in my seat. I took five weeks off from work. I wrote down all of my thoughts. Last November, when this great rally was at Tulsa, Oklahoma, I flew to Tulsa. The day after the rally, I introduced myself to uh, Sam Cooper and John Handicht, and we hold up in a little hotel room, and John turned to me and he said, Snar, what do you really want? I said, well, John, all I want is just to speak for 50 minutes at a rally uh, three months from now. He said, well, let me see. That's uh, the Charlotte rally on February 16th. And then uh, he laid it on the line. Well, who's Doug Snar? And I gulped. I said, John, you got a real good point. And then he put it to me. Listen, we go with the big names. And then uh, he took another shot at me. Well, how many speeches have you given? He had me. I had to confess. None. Except uh, to some church gatherings in Salt Lake City. You mean to tell me that you're not a professional speaker and you're not on the circuit? That's right. Then they all broke out and laughed. Now listen, Snar, we have 10 speakers a week call us. Professionals, the best in the business. We haven't made an exception yet, least of all to 100% amateur. And then I countered. Now that all may be true, but my name it's Doug Snar. And then Sam Cooper, who had been real quiet. Sam saw my point. Okay, Snar, we'll let you go 30 minutes at Charlotte. And I held firm. No, I want 50 minutes just like Paul Harvey and the other big boys. Now, at this point, I'm a little bit humiliated to say it took me two hours to get that extra 20 minutes. Then they were in agreement. It's a deal. Snar, 50 minutes. And if you go over, we'll turn out the lights. <laughs> I asked Sam and John if I could give that first speech, and I gave that speech in Charlotte. Can you believe it? Sam and John have asked me to speak at every rally since. And here I am right where that bolt of inspiration first struck me 12 months ago at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City. Positive thinking works. 
And if Doug Snar can do it, so can you. Now, you know, don't you, right now, really, in the depths of your soul, what you want out of this life. It really isn't so much a question of the goal, is it? But rather it is a question of making the decision, the commitment, the crossing the Rubicon, the biting the bullet. And in that context, I challenge you to make those decisions to freedom. First, look yourself straight in the eye and face the truth about you and do something about it and change your life and believe in yourself and your hunches and, if need be, reprogram yourself. But above all, reach upward and make God your partner and watch the miracles take place. Now, each of you have seen and heard a miracle today, and no one knows that more than I. Today is a very special day. My father and mother left that potato farm this morning and drove to Salt Lake, and they're sitting right over there. And my partner, that mouthpiece, Don Ray Bybee, has come all the way from Salem, Oregon, to see for himself whether I really learn to talk. <laughs> and there is one who isn't here and ought to be. Benjamin N. Bogue, my hero, the man who taught me how to talk. Bogue personified and epitomized what success and positive living and these rallies are all about. Of course, he died many, many years ago. What a pity. The stuttering school died with him. About two months ago, following our San Francisco rally, I received in the post a certified letter from an M.D., a Dr. Willis J. Bogue. I want to read just a few lines to you. Benjamin Bogue was my father's brother. He was born on a farm in Indiana. He attended college, but went back to the farm after two years because they made fun of his stuttering. He then developed a system and cured himself. He started a stuttering school in 1900. He had students from all over the world. My uncle, had no degrees. His method was made up of simplicity, which he inherited from his Quaker ancestry. His wife died early of cancer. He had no children. And I hope that you, Doug Snar, will continue to help troubled young people. And my answer to that letter is, as long as I live, so too will Benjamin Bogue. <clears throat> and that girl, 
my sweetheart, she came here today. She's sitting by her father, especially especially to hear me say to him in front of all of you and without my arm, My name is Doug Snor. My name is Doug Snor. Sam and John, please don't turn out the lights. And God bless you, each and every one. gentlemen, you just got your money's worth right there. Wow. Doug Snar. I know Doug Snar, and you know Doug Snar.